Hello, everyone. So uh, let's start. First of all, we are quite happy to be here at Kubecon. This is our first Kubecon. I'm Fabiano Fidencio. I work for Intel and I'm part of the Kata Containers Architecture Committee and one of the maintainers of some parts of the Confidential Containers project. I'm Jens Feynman. I'm an engineering manager at Red Hat and I contribute to the COCO project mostly on the operator side of things. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can consume confidential containers in a re really easy way. We are going to cover uh, what is confidential containers, a very quick uh, introduction to that. We're going to talk a little, a little bit about Kata containers. And this makes me think, who here is familiar with Kata containers? Raise your hand. Oh, that's nice. Cool. Uh, we are going to explain how we went from Kata containers to confidential containers. We are going to cover a little bit of the different flavors of confidential containers that we have, uh, show some use cases, and finish with a short demo. So, confidential containers. Uh, this is an umbrella project. Uh, the front door of the project is the operator. We are going to be showing the operator today, but it also, uh, the repo also includes a bunch of other uh, projects. We have a key broker service, we have attestation agent, attestation service, we have lightweight virtual uh, firmware to start the confidential containers VMs. We have Rust, Rust li uh, libraries for pulling, encrypting, decrypting uh, images, and we also have a place for, for different flavors of confidential containers. And of course, Kata containers is not part of the project officially as in like hosted on the same GitHub repo, but we have a really strong relationship with Kata Containers. Confidential Containers project has been part of CNCF for one year now, a little bit more than that. We are a sandbox project. And as you can see, we have like a bunch of companies contributing to this right now. Going through CSPs, silicon vendors, software vendors, and some uh, research institutes, and we are expecting more. So what is the value proposition of the project? We really want to, product, to protect data in use, like we know how to protect uh, data in transit, we know how to protect data in storage, but our focus here is how to protect data in use at pod level, this is important. There are projects that are doing this uh, at node level. We decided to take a different approach, do this at the pod level, and we are leveraging these trusted execution environments. We really want to simplify how people can use those TEs, mainly when focusing on the cloud native echo space. We want to enforce uh, security requirements and transparent deployment of unmodified containers. So this should be just lift and shift. Uh, we are trying to make this transparent, supporting multiple TEs, which means that choose, your, choose the flavor of the vendor that you want to, to, to play with. We would try to support that. And of course, we want to separate uh, CSPs from guest applications as much as we can. So the focus of the project I'm going to skip this. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about Kata containers and I'll get back to this quite soon. So uh, I saw that a bunch of people here are familiar with Kata containers. That's nice. Uh, you can see this picture here on the right inside, my right, <laughs> your left. Uh, we have traditional containers. Like those are isolated via namespaces. We can have seccomp. Uh, we can have Mandatory access control like SA Linux. Uh, and we have like capabilities, right? Each container running on its own namespaces. Which is good, but if there's an attack, uh, you end up like on the host Linux kernel because this is shared. So, what Kata containers, when it, it was started like several years ago, we had the idea to just come up with a micro VM and have. Exactly, exactly the same things that you have with traditional containers, but with an additional layer, isolation layer, of the micro VM. So it helps to protect one workload to another, 
it enhances that protection and it also protects the host against the malicious or untrusted workload. So, uh, Kata containers, how, how it actually works, like a really quick example. Uh, you start your Nginx pod, it will go to the Kubelet, Kubelet will start the CRI engine. CRI engine will, be, will then be responsible for starting the shin. The shin will create a virtual machine. This virtual machine will boot up. We have like a special guest uh, that is used for Kata containers. We have this agent embedded there. This agent is responsible for the managing the lifetime, the life cycle of the containers. And we put the image on the host side. We share this image with the guest using uh, virtual UFS. And that's pretty much what you, we have here. So that's Kata containers. And let's go and talk a little bit on how to get from Kata containers to confidential containers. The first thing here is we want to use these. We want to have and take advantage of the encrypted memory. By the way, this slide has an issue. If you find the issue, talk to me later on. I'm gonna give you a gift. But yeah, so with the, the confidential containers, the first thing we had to do was take advantage of the TEs, start the virtual machine. Now this uh, virtual machine is running into this encrypted memory. No one has access to that. But that, that's like partially good, but this does not ensure that your workload running will be secure or can actually trust or work in an environment where you don't trust the hardware. The next step that we did was actually changing the, the image that is pulled to be pulled inside the guest. That is a workaround, kind of workaround that we started with. Uh, this is used for peer pods. We're gonna talk about peer pods later, but this is actually used for uh, different flavors, but this does not scale for CSP. So Alibaba and Microsoft have been working on a proposal to make this better in a way that it can actually scale for the CSPs. But yeah, the container image is protected, so CSPs do not have access to that. And then the last part is actually having a way to attest that what you are running is actually what you are expecting. So we have an attestation agent that will talk to a key broker service and only then start running the workloads. We have a nice talk later today after lunch about this topic. So please attend that and we're gonna give links. So with this, just getting back to that previous slide, with Kata containers, we really want to protect one workload from each other. We want to protect the host from untrusted workloads. With confidential containers, we are adding one more barrier there. We now do not trust the infrastructure. This image summarizes a little bit uh, what I just explained, and this is what I would like you guys to take away of how we went from Kata containers to confidential containers. Jans? Yeah, thank you, Fabiano. So Kata containers comes in different flavors, and we can distinct them by the grade of isolation that they provide or what they isolate. Um, first one is process-based isolation, and that's provided by the Enclave CC project that's using the SGX technology from Intel. Then there's a second one, VM-based isolation, and that's where Kata Containers comes into play. Basically, using all the different TEE technologies from different hardware vendors, there's Secure Execution from IBM, there's Ceph from AMD, there's TDX from Intel, and there's more to come. So all of these are kind of under the hood of the Confidential Containers project, and as, I, as we said, the goal is kind of to um, unite them in one project and make all of them usable using the same software. So users can, users can um, choose what kind of isolation they require. There's another flavor, and that's not 
related to hardware technology. It's kind of related to how we deploy the containers and pods. And so there's a sub-project on confidential containers. It's called, we call it peer pods. And it's basically making use of the Kata remote hypervisor. So what does remote mean in this context? The Kata virtual machine that started in this case is not launched inside the, my worker node, inside my cluster. Instead, it's launched outside of the cluster. And how do we do that? The cloud API provider tool basically talks to the cloud service provider's APIs to create a machine, a virtual machine. And what's the connection to confidential containers here? Well, this virtual machine can be a confidential virtual machine using the TE technology and it's attested and measured. So you have a, a base, a trusted base to run container workloads uh, on this machine. Cloud API adapter has support for quite a few cloud providers. Um, we have a few listed here, but it's extendable. More can be added and it's not that hard. So peer parts are really a complex topic. You can do a lot of things with it um, and it deserves its own talk. And in fact, there was a really good talk at the OC3 conference in February. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a link to the recording in the slides and I can highly encourage you to go and watch that to learn more just about this topic. So now we talked a lot about technology. Um, let's talk about use cases. Where do you use confidential uh, computing in general and with that also confidential containers? So first adopters of this technology are regulated industries. They have to keep up with rising demands for regulation. Everything becomes more strict and they have to apply to those new rules and still run their workloads, still run their businesses. And that's where confidential computing and confidential containers can help. So it's usually financial services, government, and also healthcare, a few others. But here we picked one example, a simple one, um, from healthcare. So imagine a hospital uses an application that's running in the cloud how can I be sure that the application that's running in the cloud is in a secure environment? Because it's, they're trusting patient data uh, to this application, test results, personal information, things like this. So if the application is running in a secure environment, protected by a TDE, um, and we have a an service, an attestation service that basically can confirm the identity and the, of this workload and the stack that it's running, so we know exactly that what is running there is what we expect to be running there. And we can do this by basically using attestation services, remote attestation. And how this works, you should go to the talk in the afternoon. So uh, Jeremy will explain details about how attestation works, what different models of remote attestation there are. Um, so it will be, I think, at 2 p.m. or 2.30 p.m. So this model can be extended to third parties. Um, we can include, for example, a diagnostics provider that processes medical image data and then gives back a result. And we can extend the trust basically by um, running this application in the same kind of environment. And it can use the same infrastructure to prove its identity and prove that it's running in a uh, secure environment with encrypted memory and the exact stack that we expect to be running there. So this was one. Um, just another uh, example that we want to briefly mention. Imagine you're running a machine learning workload using Apache Spark, which is a well-known open source project. It basically, if you run it on Kubernetes, it deploys a driver pod and it deploys executor pods, and those process the data. So what we can do to enable this for confidential containers is basically one simple change uh, when you run your Spark job, you can specify also a top pod template and you just need to add one new line for the runtime class name. And that means the pods will run not the normal run C-based container runtime, but using the confidential container runtime. So and that's how we change it from using normal container technology to this confidential containers that's based on Kata containers with this runtime class name. So in this case, it means the user data is always encrypted with a key provided by the user in storage. When 
these pods come up, uh, driver and executor pods, they start the attestation, um, get fetch the key if the attestation was successful. So if the uh, software has not been changed or um, started in a different environment or has been modified in some way, the attestation will be successful. And then the key will be released to decrypt the data. That's what the pods internally can do then. And it will be, for example, provided in an ephemeral volume, uh, the key, and then the workload can decrypt the data before it starts its actual work. So this is something that we'll actually um, demo at the Red Hat booth tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, you can come and join and watch that. So now we talked a lot. Um, let's show a quick demo. Ah, okay. So what this demo will show is how you can deploy the confidential containers operator, which is hosted in Operator Hub IO. And we will show how you can modify what it uh, deploys and how it deploys things on your cluster. And then we'll ju let's just run a simple workload using what we just installed. So let's get started. So the prerequisites are you need a running Kubernetes cluster and you have your nodes have to be ready for confidential computing, so you have to have the right hardware and it has to be configured, including the BIOS setup. Let's take a look at the cluster. Um, it's a one node cluster in this case, running just the default things. And now we're going to um, deploy the, our operator version 0 0.5, which was just released last week. Just apply this manifest, which will create the namespace and the subscription and so on, installed via um, M. And now we're just waiting until the um, actual operator deployment is coming up. So, so far we have only deployed the operator. We have not triggered the actual installation of the components of the artifacts. We'll do that in the next step. And for that, we create a custom resource. It's called CC Runtime. So let's check if it's actually there after the installation. And yes, it is. Um, next step, we have to create an instance of this custom resource. And here we just take a look at an example. It shows you can um, specify a payload image that has the contents that all the artifacts, binaries, config files that you want to deploy. There are also hooks for running a container image for pre-install to prepare your cluster and also for post-uninstall to clean up things in case you have something custom. So this is a default example, it's very robust, it kind of includes all the different kind of artifacts that we have um, for different technologies. So this is where you can go in and customize it for your needs, really. And um, in the next step, once we've shown all of this, um, we'll actually apply this manifest, and that will start the actual installation. So in the next step, we're going to be doing just that apply, and what happens now is um, the controller is watching this custom resource and it's starting the installation process, basically running daemon sets, the ones that we specified in the custom resource. We see the pre-installed daemon set is already finished and the actual installed daemon set that's deploying the uh, binaries from the payload image is running. It will also create the runtime classes so here we have one for vanilla Kata containers and then uh, others for the combination of hypervisor technology and TE technology. Now we're taking a look at all the artifacts and stuff that was deployed to the nodes. So we have a bunch of binaries, QMU, um, Kata container components, and a lot of configuration files. We also have um, the kernel images, the initial RAM disks that we need for the virtual machines, and we have a bunch of firmware and BIOS files that we also need. So this is a lot, but keep in mind, um, this is for all the different kind of technologies. Um, that's where you come in and customize it to your needs. What technology are you using? What do you want to deploy? What do you want to run? So in the next step, um, we'll create a simple Nginx pod. In this case, we are using the runtime class name for Kata containers. Um, this is the only change that you make to your deployments. You change the runtime class name in your 
pod templates or deployments. So now we're waiting until the pod is coming up, and then in the final step, just going to make sure it's actually running and we can access it. So this will be, a, now it's up, and now we're going to check if we can access it, and yes, there's the page. So that means the pod is running and everything was working as we expected. And that's the demo. Yeah. Okay, so in the demo, we've shown that it's easy to deploy the operator. It's basically one command. Then it's another step that you have to do is create a custom resource, which you can modify to your needs or not. You can also use the default one if you just want to play with it for now. And then we've shown how you can, using the correct runtime class name, uh, run a simple deployment. And so we just released version 0 0.5. Um, as Fabian mentioned, it's a, it's a young project. Um, but this is our biggest release so far. It has a bunch of new and large features. We mentioned PeerPods, the other very interesting ones. And basically, we're here to encourage you to actually go ahead and give this a try, play with it. Um, if you are interested, also join our Slack channel in the CNCS workspace. Um, we have a weekly community meeting where all of you are welcome to join and um, discuss your use cases, discuss your needs. Um, if you want to contribute, that's also a good first step. And um, yeah, so please come and join the community. Tell us what you expect, what you need, what your use cases are. So, as we already mentioned, there's a really interesting talk today in the afternoon given by Jeremy Piotrowski from Microsoft. He will go more into the low-level details of how this works, starting from the hardware technology to VMs are deployed, how attestation is going to work, um, different types of attestation, all these things. So, I highly, highly encourage you to go there and watch this talk as well. There have been other great talks in past KubeCon conferences. Um, they all talk about the purpose of confidential containers and confidential computing, but they look at it from a different angle, so it's also worth watching those talks as well. And I think with this, we're at the end of our talk, and uh, hopefully have some time for questions. There's one question here. What are the, the hardware requirement uh, to use this uh, con confidential con con container? Hardware requirements, was that the question? So the question was, what are the hardware requirements? And basically you need a server with a CPU chip that has this uh, technology uh, enabled. So Intel, TDX, uh, or processors, AMD, SCV. Uh, there are different flavors of AMD SF, so make um, and or there are other hardware platforms as well, like IBM uh, C, that you have to use. Uh, just to compliment. Uh, just to compliment. You can test it, you can run and develop without having access to T. Uh, for, like the, this demo, for instance, this demo, for instance, was recorded in the development ex uh, environment that I have. So if you just want to give it a try, you don't have to have a TE. If you want to actually use it, you have to have one of those machines and availability is coming. It's not like everywhere right now. And maybe to add to that as well, we have a blog describing exactly this from a colleague of ours, that how you can try and try this out without having the actual hardware. Um, we'll make sure to add the URL to the slides after the talk. So if you're interested, um, just look it up in the slides and you can follow the blog. It's actually a tutorial how to do it without having the hardware. Are there more questions? No more questions? Oh, there's one. I 
I was just curious, what's the performance overhead of running an application in a, a confidential container as opposed to regular containers? So I'll let Fabian add to that, but um, basically the overhead that you have starts with um, the overhead that you have for Kata containers. And so that's, I'll let Fabiana speak to that. Um, but on top of that overhead for co confidential containers, I would say that's, but this is the biggest overhead. And what comes on top for conf the confidential part is not that big. Uh, so the overhead for using the encrypted memory, that, that's not that big. It's like notable, but when you're talking about Kubernetes, like it's gonna take a few seconds to shadow your pod anyways. Uh, a big overhead that comes is those technologies do not support, for instance, hot plug. You cannot hot plug memory, you cannot hot plug CPU. So once you start a pod, that's going to locate the memory that you need. And that's a reasonable overhead. But like time-wise on running should not be, again, uh, a showstopper. Was, well, were, I, uh, were we able to, to answer your question? Uh, so the benchmarks uh, should come from the hardware vendors, right, from silicon vendors. Uh, they have, we don't have these as part of the talk. But contact us and we can point you to the right benchmarks for, depending on the TE that you are using, of course. Maybe, so in general, um, this, the workloads that you would run on these are not uh, things like function as a service where it uh, depend on a minimum latency for workloads to come up and then disappear. Um, it's probably going to be in the first uh, run more be like long running workloads where the startup time doesn't matter as much. Hello. So um, I'm not really knowledgeable in uh, trusted execution environment, but I'm wondering, like, if you really don't trust the platform uh, on which you are running, how can you know that uh, the API that you are accessing, that ensure you that you are uh, running like uh, securely, is not like fake? Is like uh, really enforced by the CPU and really you have access? It's not been messed with. If you really don't trust it. Should I? Um, so it depends on what kind of API. What are we talking about? The uh, peer ports? Was that your question? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you are executing your container, and you are trust that your container cannot be accessed by the by the platform, right? Uh, sorry. Okay, yeah, but it's it's the one providing you the like the the platform to run your machine, right? So how can you know that you are declaring, like you say, okay, well, I want this to be secret, but what you get is really, really secret. Like you don't get like a fake service providing that, but actually people can look at, into what's in, in it. Oh, okay. Um, so basically, the, there's a rule of trust showing you that uh, from the hardware level that um, the environment that you're running is based on this uh, on this hardware level uh, certificate. Um, so when you get the attestation report, it's, come, it's uh, going into the CPU, basically creating this attestation report, and that's based on a uh, key provided by the hardware manufacturer. And from there, it's like always in security, a chain of trust up to the running system. Does that answer your question? Just to compliment, at this point, you trust the hardware vendor, right? You are buying a hardware from, from some vendor, you trust that vendor. What you don't trust is everything that is using that, right? So, so that's the, how the vendor is providing the key, you trust that, and then everything that Ian said. Does someone else, preferably in the front here, uh, <laughs> have some questions? <laughs> If in the back, that's okay as well. It's my turn. 
Okay, so. Oh, okay. Uh, let me go. Thank you. Uh, my question would be uh, how you manage the uh, the fact that pods are moving from one node to another when you have uh, encrypted enclaves, memory, and and and, and CPU. <laughs> um, so the question is how do you manage that workloads move from one node to another? Um, basically, as you move nodes um, and you start, let's say you you move to uh, you move the pod to another node and you recreate the virtual machine. It has to go through the same process that it did on the first place, uh, did on the first node. Questions from the back? <laughs> <laughs> Over there. Over there. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you mentioned that uh, to benefit from this hardware T is you um, need uh, support from the CPU and you mentioned Intel and AMD, SCV and so on. Uh, have you considered support for platforms based on ARM? So actually, um, it's up to the hardware vendors to join the project and contribute. Um, in fact, there was, I think, a first PR from ARM the other day. Um, so that's coming. Um, in general, as hardware providers uh, learn about the project and want to join, um, typical workflow is that they join one of the community meetings and um, state what their intent is and send PRs and they will usually be integrated into the project. Yeah. You want to add something? That's it. Okay. More questions? In one, in two. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> no, it wasn't so much a question, but relating to the benchmarking question earlier, it is something that's come up in the community. So far as nobody's volunteered to help write it, I think we'd like it from the perspective of the community rather than the hardware vendor. So it's not really a race to the bottom or top, whatever way you look at it. So if anyone's interested, in coming up with a way of benchmarking what we're talking about here generically for the community to at least as a starting point allow people to try it out in their environment then all help gratefully received. <laughs> and he's James, he's one of the folks who work directly on, on peer pods. Thanks James. Thank you.